Um, I think this room, looking around, these are folks who've been following this issue for a long time. Most of you, I think, come to this with the, we actually need safer vehicles. Most of the things we're talking about here are critical. We want to mandate them, if anything, because there's value to them. Whatever your view is about autonomous vehicles, some degree of these things are going to be you know, incredibly critical. Um, so when more recently, uh, Donnie Washington, who's going to take over from here, um, and uh, uh, our friends at the Automotive Coalition for Traffic Safety um, said, hey, guess what happened? A law passed, and there is a mandate, and there will be rulemaking, and guess what it does? We were both super excited because obviously the safety value of ensuring that we reduce deaths and, and uh, the challenges of uh, driving while impaired are significant. But I think like many in this room, we said, oh, yes, but how is that going to work and where is the data going to go and what technologies are going to be used? And some of those bad things could happen if industry and civil society and consumer advocates and safety folks and policymakers don't agree on a real framework that ensures that the benefits that we want are what we have and that all the concerning elements um, are forestalled. And maybe it's early enough, even though folks have been working on aspects of this technology for years, maybe it's early enough that unlike these other sectors where we're trying to fix the problem, we're trying to fix ad tech, but there's already billions and billions of dollars and tons of companies, and there's a lot of kind of pain and debate and lobbying when you simply say, no, that business model isn't quite working anymore. We're setting up rules. And certainly we have the same challenges when it comes to the other areas. I think we're at a time today where we've got a long enough cycle given the way automotive technology develops. We've got enough, I think, thoughtful folks on the policymaker side at government who get that the right balance here is critical. And I'll close with this. Although we're going to focus, I think, in some large part on the um, specific technology around driving while impaired and some of the other related issues, I think this is a model, perhaps, there are a dozen other areas where we probably could have your car be safer in a lot of ways by knowing more about you, but exactly what society wants, right? We could have your car be enormously safe and give you a speeding ticket every time, you know, you looked away from the road or, you know, penalize you for all sorts of reasons. And we kind of know we don't want that, right? But we do want social incentives. We do want insurance playing some role, even if it's not perhaps some of the concerns that we saw in recent um, uh, newspaper articles. We obviously do want social policy promoting the kind of health, healthy activities we want. I'm optimistic. Often we end up having debates. The industry wants that and civil society wants that and the policymakers are there in the beginning. Our hope is that this is sort of an area where we can hammer out the kind of consensus that shapes policy, that gives us the benefits and eliminates or minimizes the risks. Let me hand over to our lead for mobility and location, Donnie Washington, who has spearheaded these activities. Donnie, please. Okay, I'm pretty sure the microphones are on if my panelists would like to join you. Um, wherever your heart tells you. I think it was me. I'm not sure. Oh, Should we turn them off until we have to talk or keep them on? Yes. That might be nice. Did that work? <laughs> now the IT people are going to be like, why did, why you, did you do that? that? Oh, Someone's ringing. Oh. Yes. <laughs> it would not be an event if we didn't have a phone ring. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming um, and for joining us this afternoon, evening. Not quite sure what you'd consider 4.30, um, <laughs> but I'm very happy to have you all here. Very happy to um, have my panelists. Um, there is a lovely report um, that came out this morning that myself and others uh, spent tireless hours to get to you all. Um, the survey results are in there, in addition to a number of our recommendations as it relates to vehicle safety systems, uh, which is our lovely catch-all term uh, for, well, first of all, if you've looked at the report or work in this space, you understand that we have infinite number of acronyms. Um, and we love to sprinkle them in at any given moment. Um, and so if you hear one, um, we are going to do our best to try and give those to you before we say them, for those of you who might not know what they are. Um, so vehicle safety systems is our catch-all term for um, advanced driver assistance systems, driver monitoring systems, and impaired um, Impairment detection, um, oh wait, oh no, see, I'm gonna do it right now. Um, 
impaired detection systems. Yes. Okay. I know. I'm like, wait. So as you can see, again, acronyms get, get the best of me all the time. Um, so why don't we get started? Um, we're here today because in January 2024, as Jules mentioned, um, you know, or in January of 2024, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration released their ANPRM on impair, um, advanced impairment Oh my goodness gracious, guys. Advanced, impaired driving Advanced driver impairment <laughs> detection technologies. Um, and that ANPRM came out of the 2021 Infrastructure Act, um, which mandated that these impairment technologies be put into vehicles. So FPF started to investigate. And here we are today to kind of think about what privacy means in the context of not only the impairment detection systems, but also in the broader context of um, any of these systems for, you know, whether it's to help you ensure that there is someone or something in the back seat, or making sure the driver, um, your lane uh, assistance is there, all these different technologies that kind of exist in vehicles now and some that are forthcoming. So let me introduce my wonderful panelists and then we can get right into it. So on my far right here, we have Hillary Kane, who is the Senior Vice President for Policy at the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. She oversees policy development for the association and works with the policy team to advance the association's policy priorities and objectives. Hillary previously served as the Vice President of Technology, Innovation and Mobility Policy at Auto Innovators and spent nearly eight years as Director of Technology and Innovation Policy at Toyota. Um, to my right, my immediate right, we have Kristen Kingsley, and Kristen is the Director of Program Development and Outreach at the Automotive Coalition for Traffic Safety, where she is working to deploy alcohol detection technology to prevent drunk driving through the Driver Alcohol Detection System for Safety, the DADS program. She has more than 25 years of experience in roadway safety, including at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, our favorite acronym, and the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. And in the middle, we have William Wallace, William Wallace, and he's the Associate Director of Safety Policy for Consumer Reports, the independent nonprofit and nonpartisan member organization. He leads CR's public policy and advocacy work related to motor vehicle safety and vehicle automation, as well as household product safety. Um, all three of these individuals uh, have talked to me throughout the process, um, in addition to others at ACTS who I've spoken with, and they're great to not only talk about this particular report and topic, but also obviously have many years combined in the vehicle space. And so with that, I would like to kick it over to you, Hillary. Um, your work at the Alliance has been incredibly important as connected cars um, and software-defined vehicles have gained more attention from those outside of the automotive space as well as those in the automotive space. Could you give us a little bit of an understanding of what vehicle privacy and what that looks like for OEMs, um, original equipment manufacturers, so car makers, um, and uh, what that looks like for OEMs and generally automotive space? See, I knew it was gonna do that. That's why I just said I was scared. Turn okay. it off. Okay. I'm not gonna turn it off again, I promise. Is it working? Okay. Yes. Thank you. First of all, thank you um, for having this conversation, and thank you for the report that you uh, released today. I think we were talking uh, at the events of this this session. At, I, I'm, it's really well done, and there's a lot of really useful information in it, particularly as it relates, I think, to the survey uh, data and how consumers are thinking about these things. Very, very useful for me um, and for auto innovators as we think about uh, these issues going forward. So. How do we think about privacy? So I think for us, we are primarily focused as an auto industry in giving consumers confidence, right? That the data that their vehicles are generating is being used in a privacy protective way and in a way that they would expect that it is being used. Um, and really that's part of building confidence and trust for us in the technology itself. There's no gain that comes to the automakers if the technologies that they are putting out there are not trusted uh, by the consumers who are purchasing the vehicles with that technology. Um, I think the industry has really tried to be very proactive um, about this. Folks in this room may be aware that it was all the way back in 2014 before privacy was the hot topic that it is today, uh, that the industry tried to come together, or, and did come together, and produce um, a privacy code of conduct to try to get ahead of some of this 
um, conversation, recognizing the technologies that were going to be coming online in coming years and wanting to build that trust and confidence with consumers. Um, we hopefully will have an opportunity to maybe dig a little bit deeper into the principles again because there's a lot in there that mm -hmm. is relevant here. I mean, for just quickly, for example, um, there are particular categories of data that are called out in the principles for higher heightened levels of protection, and two of which are, are covered throughout your report. So driver behavior information, which I think driving a vehicle drunk would be an indication of, or would be a type of driver behavior information, and biometrics. And so there are, for example, in the principles, uh, prohibitions on sharing that type of data with third parties in the absence of affirmative consent. So we've already got some industry um, standards that are in place around that sort of thing. Um, the last thing I'll say before, because I want to hear from everybody else too, um, is one of the things that I took away from the survey data in the report you, you released today um, was that despite what may have been covered in the news over the last several months, mm -hmm. when it comes to consumers, they are still very trusting of the automakers uh, when it comes to the data that vehicles are generating and what automakers are doing with it. I think your report showed that of many, many sectors that were covered, automakers were by far ahead mm -hmm. um, of other sectors in terms of the trust that the consumers have in automakers when it comes to their data. And so we're, we must be doing something right. I think we have more we can be doing, but um, was excited to see that. Sure, thank you. I think um, and the images in the report are, are lovely and in color for you. Um, and you can see very clearly that Hillary is right. When we asked consumers about where they had trust um, in terms of their data, they did highlight that automakers were was one of the industries that they had a decent amount of trust. Um, a lot of the words that they used to describe the way that they felt about the technology in cars was positive. Um, and it definitely outweighed the negative words that were used. Um, and one of the things I think that we did especially want to highlight with the report is people are looking forward to these technologies um, in, in kind of varying formats for safety, um, for assistance. I mean, I definitely like when my car beeps at me if I'm parallel parking in DC, um, and that is something that I, I do really appreciate. Um, and so with that, actually, I'll go to you, William. So sorry, I keep saying the full name. Will, I will go to you. Um, your work at Consumer Reports focuses on safety. Can you elaborate a bit on how safety and privacy um, might be seen as at odds? Um, sometimes we think about you know, the privacy concerns and the safety concerns, and somehow they can't meet in the middle, or we have to have one without the other. Um, could you kind of elaborate on, on that conversation and why that's inaccurate? Sure, and uh, I mean, I'm glad you said that, that we think they're inaccurate, that that's inaccurate, because we do. <laughs> we think that you absolutely can have safety and privacy. Um, but f first of all, I do want to echo my thanks to Future of Privacy Forum and also to you, Adani, for all your work through this process um, with the drunken impaired driving prevention technology comments. I mean, it's really, I, I mean, it shows the, the best of, um, you know, a collaborative approach, one that really involves talking to everybody. Yes. And so I just want to want to credit you for that. Um, at Consumer Reports, so, you know, I mean, we, we wear a lot of different hats. We have a lot of different parts of the organization. We have testing, we have journalists, we have advocates here in D.C. And um, we also focus on a variety of different issues. So, you know, your run-of-the-mill scams all the way to um, the cutting edge of, of privacy and safety and sustainability as well. So for us, we are always looking at this through both lenses. We're always looking at this both through, through the lens of safety and privacy. And so when we see credible, compelling research, uh, including from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, showing that drunken impaired driving prevention technology can save upwards of 10,000 lives every single year. We take that really seriously and we view it as a question of how can we get this done, not whether. Um, I would say that, you know, to answer the question about safety and privacy being at odds, I, I, I would say that there's, there's actually a bit of a history now um, when it comes to um, safety and privacy needing to be um, evaluated at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, and this, you know, this first came up, uh, not first, but it, 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 it did come up when it came to the Driver Privacy Act nearly 10 years ago now. Um, and, and black boxes in cars, uh, electronic data recorders, and um, what the policy would be, what the privacy law would be around, ar around that data. It came up <coughs> in the um, V2V rule at NHTSA. It, it came up in, uh, which, which did not advance, but which certainly had to account for privacy and security in myriad ways at, in, in that proposal in 2016, 2017. 
And, and now it's coming up again. I think when you, um, when you talk to consumers and you talk to, to them about their vehicles, there's a lot they like about their vehicles. They also, I mean, the idea of having a, a, an in-cabin camera is, is very new. And we don't fully understand what their reaction is going to be yet. Um, and so we, we need to approach it with, um, with some real caution. Uh, what I mean by that is we need to approach it with um, um, making, making clear that they have real control over their data and that um, that, that information isn't going to go anywhere if they don't want it to. So um, uh, that's, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Perfect. Um, and Kristen, in your current role, you are at, as you mentioned, the Automotive Coalition for Traffic Safety. I think moving forward, we can say ACTS now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Um, and then I've got a follow up for you. Yes, thanks Adani for inviting me and thanks to all of you for joining us for this discussion. It's very important. The report was really enlightening, um, very well done. And I think most important to us is the recommendations that are coming out of it. So I'm looking forward to talking more about those today. Um, the Automotive Coalition for Traffic Safety is a nonprofit organization that is supported by the world's leading auto manufacturers. We are um, in partnership with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, developing technology to prevent alcohol impaired driving through the DADS program, which is the Driver Alcohol Detection System for Safety. And that program, since the beginning, has been very concerned about protecting consumers' privacy because the only way we're going to be able to deploy broadly is with consumer acceptance. And privacy is at the forefront of that. So we're here because we want to talk about the things that we're doing. We also want to encourage others to do similar things, to follow the recommendations and put protections into place, and to make sure that customers know what's happening to their data. Sure, thank you. Um, and uh, as Will mentioned, we talked to a number of individuals before we finished and finalized the report. We did have to get an understanding from kind of all, all sides, right? We talked with car manufacturers, we talked with Hillary, we talked with um, Consumer Reports, we met with ACLU, um, we talked, of course, with ACTS, we talked to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, we talked to MAD, we had multiple conversations to understand where everyone felt um, about this and everyone was aligned in terms of respecting privacy implications and understanding that they did exist in this context, but how do we take those next steps and what do we ensure um, happens? And so that's where our recommendations really started, when we had those conversations and understood um, what it would take for a manufacturer to put these technologies in a vehicle, um, how consumers might feel about that technology being in there, and then even from the production side, for the, from those working on that technology, what needed to happen to actually make the technology um, um, work and come to light today. Um, and so Kristen, if you don't mind, I'll stick with you um, and shift gears just a little bit. Uh, could you provide for those of us who um, are not as in the weeds and uh, talking with NHTSA as often, um, some insight and understanding maybe um, about how NHTSA, the Department of Transportation, uh, considers or, or thinks about privacy and data. I know that um, is where you worked before. Um, and so it, as Will also highlighted, they've done a number of things kind of over the years and we've seen some things happen. Do you have any uh, thoughts or insight on, on how they might be thinking about it? I won't claim to speak for NHTSA um, <laughs> or, or to say that we've even been speaking about this topic specifically, but I do know they care very much about privacy. Um, even though it's not within their authority to regulate privacy, it is something that the Safety Act requires of them, which is their author authorizing statute. Any rule that they promulgate has to be practicable. And part of practicability includes consumer acceptance, which includes privacy. And so whenever they do um, promulgate a regulation, it includes a privacy impact assessment. And we did see some allusion to privacy in the advance notice of proposed rulemaking that was released just a few months ago. So they did provide an opportunity for the public to comment and provide input on that. Thank you. Yes, they are thinking about it. I was very excited to see a set of questions just for me <laughs> in the ANPRM. Um, they did accomplish that. Uh, so one question to you all before we get a bit more into the ANPRM. Uh, what aspects of vehicle technologies are being overlooked with regard to privacy and consumer protection? 
I could jump in, sure. and, and maybe uh, maybe I'll I'll change the question you're sure. asking a little bit. So I don't I don't think they're being overlooked. What I'm going to flag, but I think there are a few things, challenges, unique challenges, mm -hmm. um, that I don't think we've figured out when it comes to vehicle technology and privacy. So a few I'll just flag as I was thinking about this ahead of this conversation. One, vehicles are usually owned by one person, but oftentimes are used by other people. And so how, you know, oftentimes the way we have thought about privacy is with respect to owners, but that doesn't address the privacy of passengers, it doesn't uh, address the privacy of people who may be using the vehicle, driving the vehicle, other than the owner. And we don't have an answer for that. It's you know, something that we've been talking about for years and years and years, but a, a, an issue, I think, and applicable here, right? Like if the owner of the vehicle is consenting to their data being used for driver impairment, purposes, does that mean that when I, you know, if I consent that I'm, when I lend the car to my neighbor and, right, so that, that's one. Second is vehicles oftentimes change um, owners over the course of their life and oftentimes the manufacturer doesn't have visibility into who owns the vehicle, mm -hmm. right? So if I buy a vehicle, um, I do certain consents, I receive notices, whatever it may be, I'm comfortable with the data practices of the company and then I sell my car in the private market to somebody else. Um, there's a, a challenge with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third one I'll flag is um, privacy has often been thought about in terms of the, the people in the vehicle, but then there are people outside of the vehicle, not necessarily relevant for impairment, sure. um, in specifically, but just I know that there's also, I mean, as we talk about cameras and sensors and all these things in the vehicle, there are also cameras and sensors outside of the vehicle mm -hmm. that may capture people that, um, Anyway, so those are three, again, not overlooked. They're very much looked, <laughs> like we're well, cognizant of them, grappling yes. with them, but unresolved. Sure, if, um, I, I think Kristen, you wanted to jump in, but one other thing I'll add is um, that, that point about your car is not only used by maybe the person who owns it, but think about all the people in, in DC, for instance, who don't actually own a car, but are regularly riders in Ubers, or um, oh, the free to move cars that they can rent and, and pick up, and, and the zip cars that they can use here and there. They don't have ownership over those cars, but a lot of them have new features that they would have to then um, interact with. So I think that the passenger goes beyond even you know a household and and your friends it really does delve into instances where we all are interacting with vehicles um, I'll just add that I think when you ask people what they want to what they want done with their data and their privacy they feel very strongly that their privacy and their data should be kept private until you explain to them the benefits of what they might be getting out of sharing their information. And so if you can be clear and transparent about what you're doing with their data and what the potential benefits are of that, then most people can understand that this is something that they want. So yes, yeah, please. I'll just, I'll say on, on privacy, um, you know, I was really, I, I was nodding my head earlier when Jules said, you know, when it comes to technology like drunken impaired driving prevention technology, you know, we may be at the very beginning and we may be able to avoid some of the pitfalls that we've um, stumbled into on, on, on data privacy in, in other areas. I, I, think, I think that may well be the case in certain aspects. Um, when it comes to some areas of vehicle technology, unfortunately, we already are quite a bit down the line in, in the wrong direction. When it comes to, for example, the types of disclosure and acceptance of terms that we've seen um, as the norm in infotainment systems. And so I think that we want to see, I mean, Kristen mentioned clear and transparent. We want it to be much clearer. You can have transparency, you can have it all there in a long document, but that doesn't mean that it's clear. And I'll also say when it comes to privacy, one thing that we're, you know, I mean, we're, we're, talking, we're talking primarily today about the, the ANPRM from NHTSA, but also um, driver monitoring systems are um, becoming more and more common on vehicles. And, um, in, you know, I think, especially here in this country, the main focus has been driver monitoring systems, I, a terrible name, I know, from a privacy, so from a privacy <laughs> standpoint, I know, it's just the worst name you could possibly come up with. But what we're talking about here is a safeguard for automation systems, basically. So we're talking about, when we talk about the automation systems that are on the road today, we're talking about, um, basically, they marry advanced cruise control, adaptive cruise control and um, control of the speed of the vehicle. So it's keep you a set distance um, you know, behind the car in front of you. And so um, when you combine those two systems, you end up with active driving assistance. 
And you know, what we've seen is that there are certain methods, uh, there are certain safeguards for that technology to keep the driver from checking out and make sure they're staying paying attention to the road. And some of those uh, safeguards work much better than others. By far, the system that works the best is a camera-based system today, by far. The system where you just have a little tug on the steering wheel, that alone doesn't do a whole lot at all, and, as far as we're concerned. And so um, I, I think that that leads to, for us at CR, you know, recognizing how important that technology is to, to safety when it comes to automation systems. We also have said, you know, we will not hesitate if, if, if there's an automaker that does not follow best privacy practices when it comes to the use of, when it comes to recording, when it comes to sharing data from, from cameras, um, we're going to deduct points. We're going to withhold points from you um, in, in, our overall, in your overall score. We, we reserve that right because we feel very strongly that um, ideally the system should be closed loop and um, if, again, if people um, that data must remain uh, on the vehicle if that's what if that's what the driver wants. Um, yeah. Can I just clarify that the ratings that you're um, that you're giving for the driver monitoring systems and assessing the cameras as the best option, those are specifically for engagement with the level two technologies. Correct. It's not that's for correct, yeah. impairment detection. Correct. It's not. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, it's not for impairment detection. It's for as a safeguard for um, active driving assistance systems. Perfect. And speaking of technology and the different systems, um, the lovely ANPRM did not tell us what kind of technology um, was going to be required uh, by the future Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard. Um, and so one of the big pieces and a lot of the questions in the ANPRM did look at um, how do we do this? You know, how we being um, NHTSA Department of Transportation, how do they promulgate a rule um, and, and what technology should they mention? Should they mention a technology? Should they not? What will it do? How will it work? Um, what does that look like? And so um, being our resident expert on the panel and closest to a technology that is heading in that direction, um, Kristen, uh, AXE has been at the forefront of developing technology to fit this forthcoming rule precisely. Um, since 2008, AXE has been in a public private partnership um, known as the Driver Alcohol Detection System for Safety, the DAGS program, tasked with researching and developing vehicle integrated technologies to prevent drunk driving. Um, what are your insights and thoughts about how this mandate for the forthcoming rule um, came to be and where we are achieving it? I know we've touched on that a little bit, um, but could we uh, delve a bit more into you know, how the technology started to come about um, and where we see it today? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about um, the ANPRM, NHTSA's Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, is intentionally technology neutral, which is something that they try to do with all of their regulations. And that's because at any moment in time, when they're mandating something, they don't know what is coming down the pike in the future. And so they don't want to stifle innovation. And so even though we at the DADS program are working on very specific alcohol detection technologies, we're also in favor of an all of all of the above approach to solving the problem of impaired driving and that's not just with vehicle technology that's also with education campaigns and enforcement and everything else so we were happy to see all of the questions that NHTSA was asking in the notice all of the information that they were soliciting but we're also happy to see that along the path to solving the problem of alcohol impaired driving the DADS technology that we've been working on since 2008 has the best potential for doing that. We are measuring specifically alcohol impairment and quantifying that and determining whether or not somebody is over the legal limit. And if they are, they won't be able to drive. And the status of the technology is such that it is already available for fleet applications. And that is with a directed breath and a zero tolerance. And right now we're working on making the, um, a license available by the end of 2025 for a reference design for a consumer-based application, which could be broadly deployable. And that aligns very nicely with the timeline that NHTSA has been given by the bipartisan infrastructure law, which allows some flexibility mm -hmm. in deployment. Thank you. Um, and, uh, 
over to um, you, Hillary. Uh, the Alliance for Automotive Innovation also submitted comments um, in response to this ANPRM. Um, I'd love to hear the key takeaways um, and understanding that you represent a number of automakers um, in the space, not all, but some. Um, we'll be curious to know uh, your thoughts, whether it relates to the technology um, and, and how you feel about it being technology agnostic, um, and then also any other key highlights from those comments. Yeah, so I, I'll start with the, the tech neutrality of it, which also was something that we were strongly supportive of and excited to see. I mean, we do um, want to preserve the f opportunity for innovation in this space. So there are technologies that are under development now uh, that have extraordinary promise um, and are very exciting, but we also recognize that we are at the beginning of the beginning of the innovation that we think will come about mm -hmm. um, in order to solve this problem um, in vehicles. And so we want to preserve flexibility for that innovation to flourish and um, be deployed in future years. On the privacy side, since this is the future of the privacy forum, I'll just a couple of things. Um, we are aligned, I think, completely with with everything um, folks have said already. And and you know, one of the things that we pointed out to NHTSA is is we think that they should be very um, cognizant of limiting the collection of personal information um, in anything that they mandate or require. So that that should there should be absolutely. Um, significant consideration to give given before they were to mandate any sort of collection mm -hmm. of personal information. The one, and I don't want to say exception, but one other point we made on this, and I think the report you guys released today talked about for consumers looking at this technology, they have two very, um, uh, they're very interested in two factors, mm -hmm. if I read it correctly. One was accuracy, yes. and one was privacy. Yes. Right, and so on the accuracy front, which actually was higher, if I if I read the report, yes. um, than uh, the interest in privacy, folks are very, 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 very interested in this technology being accurate. Mm -hmm. And I mention this because, especially in early days, as this technology is first being deployed, the automakers are going to feel very focused on, or they're going to be very focused on ensuring that the technology is performing mm -hmm. as expected in the real world in vehicles. So that there may be some data collection that needs to happen in order to support product improvement to make sure, you know, be able to diagnose, you know, malfunctions or underperformance or any of those sorts of things. So I just note that there is maybe in some aspects of this a little bit of tension between accuracy yeah. and privacy, and we're going to have to figure out how to navigate that. Um, Will, right before I pass it to you, I think one thing that we can do with that exact point is set the kind of set the baseline understanding for when we're talking about vehicle data, there is a portion of it that we would relate as personal information. So that um, can be anything such as your preferences for how you like your seat or um, radio stations that you tune to. Uh, we can be talking about the data that comes from, you know, if you do have a camera in your car, um, other data points that relate to uh, more specific things. There is a large category of data from your vehicle that relates to did the engine turn over? Um, and did the did the engine uh, turn over? Did the tire pressure sensor go off? There's a certain set and bucket of uh, data points that are not inherently specific to any one individual. Now, when we start talking about breaking habits um, and we start talking about speed and we start to think of a certain New York Times article that came out this week, we start to realize that, hmm, maybe certain data points in the vehicle do have some inherent sensitivity that we weren't thinking about before. Now, then you also add in the potential data point of, um, you know, let's add the camera to that. And now we can have a camera that potentially is is monitoring the individual when we add also the braking patterns and things like that. So these different uh, data points taken together can have some certain sensitivities, but it's important to understand that there are a number of data points that are coming off your vehicle and um, are being collected by your vehicle that actually aren't particularly personal and that you do want your vehicle to understand for the instance of um, does something need to be fixed. Uh, I would not know when to change my oil if my car did not tell me. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and so there are certain aspects and certain uh, bits of data that you will want your car to continue um, to do and alert you to. Um, 
Will, I'd like to, to turn to you. Um, I know we talked um, about the ANPRM, I believe, right at the end of December. So right when it was announced uh, that it was going to go live very soon. Um, and we kind of had thoughts about uh, recommendations and, and where FPF was headed. Um, I'd love for you to kind of elaborate on how Consumer Reports approach the ANPRM um, and uh, anything that you can give us kind of from that consumer perspective that I think some of us are not as close to. Sure, and so um, our, our comments primarily focused on um, these, these safeguards for active driving assistance that I was talking about earlier, um, you know, in-car cameras, um, that kind of thing. And so I realized I, I misstated what active driving assistance was. It's a combination of active dri active cru adaptive cruise control and lane uh, centering technology. We knew what you meant. So you knew what I meant. <laughs> anyway. Um, I think, so I would say that Consumer Reports is a strong supporter of the HALT Act, and we greatly appreciate the work of, of MAD and, and others who, who got that done, who really got that across the finish line, because it will save lives, it will. Mm -hmm. And so um, we are, uh, we thought our, our, our greatest area of expertise is on these systems that we're already seeing on cars today to help make sure that people are not disengaging from the driving task when they have automation support. And so we've experienced all of these that currently exist, and we currently rate all these systems against one another. We have the full report. I'm happy to send it to anybody who wants it. But I, um, I would say that we weighed in with, the, um, with our views on the different implementations of, of these technologies. And some are better, some are worse. And um, in general, though, we see a lot of promise, and we see the technology getting better very, very, very rapidly. And so um, I would say that this is definitely going to be a part of the solution. Um, whether you're talking about uh, preventing impaired driving, whether you're talking about making sure that people don't disengage from the driving task, and, and even potentially when it comes to things like nodding off at the wheel or when it comes to medical emergencies behind the wheel, things that currently people um, lead to people dying on our roads and can be, um, can be prevented or, 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 or crashes that can be mitigated in the future. So I, you know, from Consumer Reports' perspective, you know, I, I, I think it's, 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 it's undeniable that um, people, you know, if, if you're going to have a camera in the car, if you're going to have other technologies in the car collecting um, sensitive data, and certainly, you know, collecting location is sensitive, um, collecting driving data is sensitive, um, people need to know that it's, it's accurate, and they need to know that they have real, meaningful control. Right now, they don't, they don't trust that that's the case. Accuracy um, is something that now we've touched on. Um, and I think your point, Hillary, about trying to kind of uh, figure out that wrinkle when we talk about accuracy, um, the technology in general, and the privacy implications. When we say accurate, um, I don't know that we actually all have the same meaning, and I don't think uh, NHTSA does at the moment either. I think they're working to also try and understand what accurate means when we're talking about these technologies. Um, I wish I had the answer. If I had a magic wand, I'd give it to you all right now. Um, but when we are thinking about accurate, um, and I do want to use this moment to draw a bit more distinction between the types of technologies that we're talking about. Um, Will has spoken quite a bit about the um, advanced driver assistance systems um, and driver, mo uh, driver monitoring systems. Um, but I do want to ensure that we are being very clear when we're talking about the technology that um, AXE has been developing. Um, and the accuracy points there are slightly different. When we're talking about the advanced driver assistance systems, ADAS and driver monitoring systems, DMS systems, um, those systems are likely to use, um, in, are likely to infer that an individual might be drunk or, or um, intoxicated, impaired um, behind the wheel, looking, using a camera and potentially um, other features that we see in terms of uh, lane veering and things like that might infer that an individual is intoxicated, but isn't necessarily accurate, um, w you know, to determine is it actual impairment or is the individual distracted in talking to someone or is um, the individual nodding off versus are they nodding off because they are intoxicated. Um, those are slight, uh, slight differences that the um, camera in a car would not be able to detect, but the AXE technology is focused on being as accurate as possible to ensure that we are um, stopping actual impaired driving. Could you just delve a little bit more um, into the, the breath system and the touch system? Sure, yeah, I'd be glad to describe those. And I think it's, it's important to note that no system is ever going to be 100% percent accurate. And so what we're aiming to do in the DADS program is to minimize false positives and minimize false negatives. And so what that means is that for an unimpaired driver, 
they shouldn't be hassled by the system. But we also want to make sure that we don't want to let drunk drivers fall through the cracks. And so while Hillary mentioned the value of collecting data while you're providing accuracy and that, you know, that's something that consumers want, we're doing both during the testing stage. And we're doing a lot of testing, um, collecting all of this data to see what's happening. But the way these technologies are being designed is so that when they are implemented in the real world, they don't need to continue collecting all of that data to work. So they will be using the information that the sensors gather, but they will not be storing it, they will not be transmitting it. It will be used in the moment to determine whether or not that driver is impaired by alcohol and whether or not that vehicle should be able to move. And the two technologies that we're developing are a touch-based system and a breath-based system, and they're both using laser spectroscopy to determine the percentage of alcohol in a driver's breath or in a driver's blood. And following one of the recommendations from the report, that information is not tied to a specific person. Even though, yes, we can tell the difference between a driver and a passenger, yeah. we cannot tell you who that person is. It's drawing the breath, it's measuring the breath alcohol concentration, which correlates with the blood alcohol concentration, but it is not telling you there's no saliva sample, there's no DNA being collected. And the same thing with the touch system. The laser is shining through the skin to determine um, the alcohol concentration in the blood. It is not collecting your fingerprints or anything like that. So the way it works is if it identifies that a driver is impaired, you'll be able to start the car, but you won't be able to put it in motion. Thank you. Um, I think it's important, and one of the things that we did try to do in the report was draw the distinguishing, um, uh, draw that distinguishing line between technology that is actually going to detect directly for the um, impairment um, and blood alcohol levels, and the technology that might be taken together to to try and accomplish that. Um, I, I think the innovation that Hillary has mentioned and the others have mentioned about. Um, in this space will be very interesting as we haven't, you know, of course, reached a final rule at this moment. Um, but I think if, if nothing else, this was an opportunity for um, companies, be it car makers, be it third parties or other individuals to start thinking about how to innovate in this space. Um, we continuously see innovations in, in so many other spaces uh, in technology. And so this would be a very interesting one to kind of see how that goes forward. Um, and I think, you know, our recommendations come at a time when, as people are starting to think about it, they can hopefully build in that privacy um, and those protections from the moment they begin to um, put it forward. Actually, I want to take a little bit of moderator's privilege. Um, and and one of the things that I think is is interesting when we're talking about these technologies, um, that lovely little piece, as you mentioned, testing at the outset. How do we account for it um, when it becomes a rule and automakers have to now turn around and show NHTSA that the technology that they've put into cars is working? How do we reconcile, um, you know, potentially saving some of that data or not? Or how are automakers going to, to show that they are in line with the rule? You know, we would hate for um, X automaker in however many years to come for or a TikTok video to go live of individuals showing how to subvert whatever impairment detection technology exists, right? Um, and now NHTSA knocks on the door of um, X automaker and says, hey, we need you to show us that this is not true, or we need you to show us um, how it's working or how successful it's been. How do we do that? I'll go first, if that's okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry, that was not uh, prepared, but <laughs> no, I No, but it's I a must super ask. good question. <laughs> it is a, it's a very ask. good question, a very important question, and that is one of the things we're testing, is potential ways to defeat a system, because we want to make sure that we're accounting for that, and that it is something that's accurate, reliable, lasts mm -hmm. for the lifetime of the vehicle, um, and so that's something that when we hand it off to the vehicle integrators, we will be able to give them recommendations or instructions on how to implement it so that it's less likely to be tampered with, much different from something like an aftermarket alcohol interlock. Um, because these, we consider them, they're not punitive systems. These are crash avoidance technologies, not unlike a forward collision warning system or a lane departure warning system. It will prevent you from driving drunk. Well, and I'll just say, I mean, just to add to that, I mean, what I, what, part of what I heard your question, uh, part of what I heard in your question, which I think is really important, 
is once there is an FMVSS on this, automakers are obligated to comply with it. Yes. And a failure to comply with it could be a safety defect, mm -hmm. right? And failure to comply could be like if, you know, it says it has to do this and it doesn't do that 100% of the time, mm -hmm. the automaker may face enforcement action, right? So, like, going back to the question about, about data collection, right, the automakers mm -hmm. are going to, I would imagine, feel obligated to collect some data to show that the systems are working as they intend them to work and as they are expected to work under the, F, you know, under FMVSS. So mm -hmm. I just, like, there is a tension there because these will become recallable, potentially recallable um, situations. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna add again, sorry, Will. <laughs> um, there is some precedent for this with the event data recorders or mm -hmm. the black boxes because initially those were not collecting data and making data available off the vehicle. Those were intended to deploy airbags, it was just, an accelerometer that was deciding if and when to deploy an airbag. It wasn't until later when we needed to find out if airbags were deploying properly or improperly that data was being stored and made available to third parties. But the good news is this should apply also to other future technologies. That data is owned by the vehicle owner and so nobody can access it without permission from the vehicle owner. But I will say that was done through a federal law, the Driver Privacy Act. I always want to say there's the Driver Privacy Protection Act and the Driver Privacy <laughs> Act. Driver Privacy Act applied to EDR data and specifically yes. laid out under federal statute those points. So I just, I like just saying there may be an opportunity here. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> FPF people, does that count as a, <laughs> as a privacy law at the federal level? <laughs> is that what I just heard? Um, we should revisit that. Um, Will, please. Oh, sure, no, and it's just, I, I mean, it would make, make things a whole lot easier <laughs> in some <laughs> ways for, for, for NHTSA and the industry, that's for sure. Um, so um, I, I, I think, I, I just wanna speak to a couple things. First, you know, if, um, you know, right now to, to, to demonstrate compliance with a federal motor vehicle safety standard, I mean, what that means is compliance at the time the vehicle is made. So, you know, I, I think that that doesn't necessarily require ongoing data collection. Um, and I don't think we should interpret it that way, um, for sure. Um, I, I, though I understand that in the case of a potential, you know, recall, um, that may lead automakers back to the research, uh, back, back to the, their, their research tracks to see what's going on. Um, I guess I would also say that um, I want to emphasize something that hasn't come up yet, which is that NHTSA's authority and jurisdiction on privacy is really limited. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, today, Secretary Buttigieg made a big announcement about yes. um, you know, examining all the privacy practices of airlines, because there does exist um, specific authority for them to do that uh, in the aviation space. Um, you know, in the, in the car space, it's a lot more limited. And it has, there has to be that nexus with safety and practic practicability, and so, um, I, you know, it's, it's arguable, and we have argued that um, data security and prevention against um, cybersecurity vulnerabilities is, a, is, is very much about safety and very squarely within its um, jurisdiction. Um, but, but when you start talking about consumer data privacy uh, practices, there's, there's, there's got to be a role for the FTC to play here. And, um, and so um, we're going to need these agencies to work together. Um, we're gonna need to, and if they won't, then Congress needs to tell them to and make sure they do. No, um, that's perfect. If we could actually um, stick with you, I will say uh, in our recommendations, FPF does highlight the cybersecurity um, piece. We also get into it um, in our response for the ANPRM. Um, it's an area that we're starting to think about a bit more uh, in line with privacy. Um, so any cybersecurity specific questions, I'm happy to delve into those. Um, if you were hoping to hear a bit more of that, that's, that's where we can talk about that. Um, but actually staying on you, Will, um, you kind of got there a bit with uh, what should happen from um, NHTSA standard and um, federal government, but you know, Consumer Reports works on raising the standard for connected products, services, and systems across the board. Um, how do you see um, and how does the vehicle industry um, and those in the vehicle life cycle uh, raise the standard for connected cars, especially in light of new technology features? Raise the privacy standard? Um, the standard in general? 
Yeah. Standard in general, standard but in general. Uh, well, any boy. any extra leanings on privacy would be nice. Well, I think that uh, one thing that we've been um, working on, and this is this is these are my teammates, mostly not me, but um, our you know our our, our privacy and technology um, experts have been have been working on extending um, the privacy principles that we're all very familiar with when you're on your laptop to the connected uh, product space and um, laying out that that's got to be a priority for those manufacturers as well, and it's got to be foundational. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, if they're trying to account for that um, much later, you know, three years later, when suddenly they have a, a security vulnerability, that's far too late. And they've got to account at the outset for, um, for likely uh, privacy issues and security vulnerabilities. And I think that you all do a good job of, of laying out why that's so important. Um, certainly in the automotive space, it's no different. Um, perfect segue for Hillary. Um, a similar question. Um, it, how do we raise the standard as, in, as an, um, an organization that has developed wonderful principles for the industry? How do we continue to raise that standard? Um, is it building upon those principles? Is it um, working with NHTSA DOT to establish uh, more specific and built out privacy standards? What does that look like from your perspective? Yeah, a couple thoughts. So I mentioned, you know, and you mentioned the privacy principles. So we have done a review of those every two years um, and have not felt the need to update them. But I, you know, can share that we're, you know, we, as we have every two years, we're looking at them again. And, you know, I, I the now may be the time. I'm not promising anything, but now may be the time uh, where, where we uh, do some updates to reflect some uh, developments in, re in recent years. I mean, particularly, you know, what we're looking at and what we're thinking through is there, since the privacy principles were put in place in 2014, there have been a number of states, for example, that have enacted um, comprehensive privacy laws. Um, we have had a couple of vehicle-specific privacy provisions enacted into law. California, for example, passed a camera mm -hmm. privacy law. And so there may be some things like in those bills that we could integrate into the principles, for example, and have apply nationwide, right? Because I think in a lot of cases, the companies are already, you know, Compl complying with them nationwide or thinking about complying with them nationwide. So those things to give you a sample of some of what we're thinking about. Um, what, what I would say, though, what we want the most, what we are begging for is a federal privacy law. Um, that would cover our industry along with every other industry in the United States that provides a consumer product. I did not ask her to say that. <laughs> um, she really meant it. No, for um, real, like that's the answer. Federal privacy. Um, I, it's so much fun to sit on, on panels and to watch other panels and someone will always say it. If it's related to privacy, it will come up. Um, a new fun uh, bingo game for you. Um, let me take this moment to ask our panelists if we have any um, final thoughts. We do want to also open it up to questions, um, but I'll pitch it here first and then I'll come to the audience. Starting with you, Kristen. Sure. Um, I just want to say that the bottom line is here, we're talking about at least 10,000 lives per year that could be saved by advanced technologies to prevent impaired driving. And if we include distraction and drowsiness and drugs, then we're talking about more than double that. And this is something that people want. They want safety on their roadways. They want their families to be protected from motor vehicle crashes. And we can find a way to make sure that their privacy is protected while we're doing that. So it's important to get it right. Thank you. Um, and let me take a moment. Um, one thing about the ANPRM that we did not mention, they specifically highlight that the impairment is not calling out um, drugged driving. Um, I think that is one thing that when I talk to people about it and mention impaired, they're often thinking, oh, impairment in all, all types and forms. Um, and they were very clear that they are focused on intoxication um, through alcohol intoxication um, and not actually through drugged. However, um, they are not limiting the uh, possibility that these technologies could in the future also be used for that purpose. Well. So, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes auto execs have made some comments about um, how, you know, the only, it, it, it's not as if the selling the cars is the only revenue source anymore. And in fact, there's a revenue source from, from data and it's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, that may well be true. Um, I, I would say when we're talking about these safety systems, that shouldn't be part of the equation. Um, and I would say that it doesn't have to be part of the equation. 
you don't have to collect, you don't have to um, store, you don't have to share um, the data that goes into these safety systems. In fact, they, they can and must be used only for that purpose. They gotta stay on the car. And we've seen that successfully implemented with driver monitoring systems uh, for, for active driving assistance systems. And we think that's the right approach going forward. Awesome. No, I, th I, don't think, I don't think we disagree with anything that you just said, uh, which is why, as a reminder, as I said at the top, the privacy principles prohibit auto companies from sharing driver behavior information and biometric information and, by the way, location information with any third party in the absence of affirmative consent. So it's literally the code of conduct. Um, no, just I, I, all, what I'll just say is thank you again for having this conversation. And I just want and it's, it, these are the conversations that need to be had. This is my second conversation today on this top, not on the privacy, but on this ANPRM, or where I'm feeling so um, hopeful and optimistic about the ability to thread this needle yes. and get this done. Right. So um, the good news is that stakeholders from across the ecosystem are working together um, to figure out how to. Um, get this technology into vehicles. That's really exciting. So, thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, I would love to give a few minutes for questions. Um, and I'll take them just in order. Um, yes, please. Yeah, I got it. Um, <laughs> Hillary, great, great comments uh, with regard to getting consent before any data is being shared in permanent, which is great. And the problem is, you know, we're going to buy a car that consent is going to the dealership. It's a blanket consent, and it's we uh, reserve the right to share your data with third parties or marketing partners and law enforcement. And I think you your policy should be adjusted to say on a case by case basis, consent must be given, uh, because I think it's probably the case in the New York Times article that because um, I. You know, I, I reached out to LexisNexis, they said, oh, well, we don't share any data without customer consent. Well, the customer probably doesn't think or remember or realize sure. they gave consent. Yeah. So consent must be, so for the seven insurance companies that they shared data with, there should have been consent given in, in each individual case. So, so, no, so the dealers are responsible for that, not the automakers, and that's, I think, where the disconnect happens. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, I'll just say, there are definitely challenges with the way vehicles are sold in the U.S., right, so um, when it comes to these things, so acknowledge. And then I'll also just say, just to pull, pull on, the, oh, no, I just lost my train of thought. Hold on. It's going to come back to me. <laughs> no, keep going. Keep going. It'll I'm come back to me. I'll answer it later. You're going to say that the principal might actually spell out specific consent for the additional... Yes, that was kind of, thank you, Jules. That was kind of, <laughs> so there... The privacy principles do actually say that when it comes to these sensitive categories of data, location, biometric, driver behavior, that there, there is a requirement under the principles for that notice to be, and I can't, I'm going to forget the exact terms, but more, more prominent, like mm -hmm. the, to, a sort of more, yeah. I'm advocating for case by case. Right. Um, also, you made a great argument for it, how ownership changes the vehicle. Yeah. Um, also, when you rent a car, uh, you're changing the use of the vehicle. But we don't really have a clear provision for today in, in most automobiles is the ability to erase the data that you're leaving behind in the car you're either selling or renting um, so that your data is not showing up for the, for the next user. Yeah, I mean, I, I disagree with that, but but you may have had a different experience than I've had with the vehicles. Have you seen previous destinations in the rental car you've taken? Right, but usually under the, on the screen in your vehicle under settings, there's usually very prominently an ability to delete the data. Well, okay, well then you're putting it on, on the consumer. You're making it the consumer. Or the rental car company could do it when they clean the car and vacuum it. I guess I'm calling yeah. for someone to take responsibility for that. Yeah, yeah we, we would love for. the rental car companies to take responsibility for deleting the previous customer's data before they rent that vehicle to the next customer. Mm -hmm. When they're cleaning and vacuuming out the car and turning it over. It, to me, it's so logical mm -hmm. that that's where it would happen. Um, and the automakers have made the ability to delete the data from the vehicles fairly easy. And please don't make me go into details about a partner using a vehicle owned by a no longer partner that's stalking the other partner. Yes, we can be happy, to go. happy to go there. It's not a corrected problem in the yeah. industry. No, it's, it's not. The New York Times it's case. not. Uh, automatic crash notification, uh, we may very well want to be able to notify responding uh, first responders of medical alert issues of the passengers in the vehicle. So managing 
health-related data, very yeah. personal information. Very personal. In some manner, whether it's on the cloud or some kind of third party. So some thought to that. 100%. Um, okay, some if, we, <laughs> if we might, right. um, we can come back. Um, I do want to ensure that we have a few more minutes to get just a few other questions. Oh, I thought we were going to seven. Um, not as this portion. We do have a networking reception, um, and I do believe that uh, they will be sticking around for a few minutes. Um, so if, forgive me for the interruption. Um, Miles, if you would. Yeah, um, so I have a question, uh, a question that's largely about the architecture of the systems and basically how you have access to the data that is made available through these systems and the system resources in the vehicle itself. Um, so, I wanted to ask, um, you know, when it comes to these systems, are they likely to share resources across other systems that are utilized by the vehicle? Um, would they have, say, API access from a fleet management perspective? Um, even, maybe even third party um, uh, development APIs that can be utilized in some fashion, um, utilizing something as sensitive as a uh, in-cabin camera. Um, and, and I guess more generally, a um, question about where the compute for all of this actually happens. Are we talking about edge servers where that's happening um, you know, with communication from the vehicle to an edge server? Or is a lot of that uh, happening, especially for the systems that we're sort of talking about today, on the device itself um, in, within the sort of architecture of the car? I mean, I can speak to the dad's technology, and that is all happening closed loop in the car. Yeah, I think it's generally true of driver monitoring yes. systems yes. as well. Yes, yeah. that's, 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 that's our understanding, yes. The reason I'm hesitating is because I don't know that there's a one-size-fits-all answer, right? So I'm very hesitant to say this is how it's done across every single company. Um, but my general understanding is that when it comes to driver monitoring systems, and I would anticipate the same with driver impairment detection technologies, that those are on processing and storing data on board, very rarely transmitting it off. And I, and I can be even a little more, I can be a little more specific than I was before to say that we've, we've gotten confirmation from several automakers that it is done on board the vehicle. And from those who haven't confirmed, it's not that they've confirmed it otherwise, it's that they haven't answered us yet. <laughs> um, I will say one thing to think about, and many uh, automakers have many different cars, um, varying ages, um, varying types and features. Some cars you can get with souped up with all of the features, and some you have to add them on as you go. So it does uh, it does vary across the board. Um, I think Will is accurate. Um, conversations that I have had have also confirmed um, it's closed looped on the car. Um, and for instance, in um, certain instances where there's camera, uh, it might not, anything that does leave the vehicle might just be metadata that leaves the vehicle as opposed to those raw images. Um, there's a certain unnamed auto manufacturer where that's not the case, um, and I will Which let you all. Which we do not represent. Uh, no. <laughs> and I will, I will let you all uh, understand who that is. Um, but in that instance, um, a do lot I. of other manufacturers um, will, will take you know, the metadata, for instance, um, or if they take anything at all from some of those systems. Oh, yes. Thanks. Um, I have a question for Hillary. Um, sort of two parts. The first is that your principle of data minimization, data retention, and reduction section notes that automaker signatories, quote, commit to collect and cover information only as needed for legitimate, legitimate business purposes, end quote. So would that include selling data to data brokers and data monetization? I mean, the other thing I want to know is is a consensus and broken? Because I think most drivers wouldn't agree to having their data sold to LexisNexis and then insurance companies. So what can be done to fix that? Yeah, so thank you for the question. So um, if I have learned anything, so I've been working on automotive privacy now for, shoot, 13, 14 years, I think it's been. It's been a very long time. Um, and one of the things that I think, I, a takeaway that I have taken over the last several months in some of the news reports and, some report and stories that have come out is maybe we as an industry need to be rethinking how we're doing notice and consent, right? So I, like that is a takeaway. I think we're reflecting on, um, I think the challenge has been um, the intent of the notice and consent sort of system that was set up in 2014 was pure. And then as we've seen additional states enact state privacy laws that 
Um, and as a result of them, we've seen class action lawsuits, for example, in Illinois for driver monitoring systems mm -hmm. saying that that's biometric information, for example. So now what you're seeing is this flip to another direction where I think companies are trying to make sure that every possible use of data that could ever potentially even inadvertently happen is captured in them. And then okay. so you're seeing them go into a different direction where they're overly inclusive and more confusing. So I think we're, we're trying to figure out how to course correct, if that's fair to say. Um, I will say again, though, the privacy principles prohibit the sharing of driver behavior information, geolocation information, and biometric information with third parties in the absence of affirmative consent. I don't know what more, I mean, that, like, we, we tried to capture this. We tried to cover this. And any company signed up should not be doing any of that selling or sharing, sharing or selling with third parties in the absence of affirmative so consent. I'm assuming General Motors had consent for what they did as a signatory to the principles. But I don't, I, that's all I can say. Um, I, thank you, Hillary. Um, thank you for the questions. Oh, Karen. I have a question related to uh, health and sure. privacy. And that is, um, what are the implications of the Supreme Court's decision in the where the eyes may be moving constantly and easily appearing to be an impaired driver, yet they have a driver's license and they're fine. It seems to me that you need to know that they have that medical condition, that you have to create a profile about that person, segment them off, and somehow they become an exception or something, something like that. Um, what are your thoughts about protecting this privacy, in particular for the camera systems, for people? Um, I don't know, Will and then Kristen, I'd be, um, maybe not that particular um, health instance, but I know I asked a similar question of the AXE team before as it relates to accounting for health. So Will and then I, I just think it's a great question. And I, and I think that, it, you know, especially if this is enshrined in regulation, which it will be, it's, it, you know, it's got to be inclusive. And so it's, it's got to account for all consumers, all drivers. And so it, it, we can't have situations where, um, where you know, where that's not accounted for. I'll just leave it at that. So in the DADS program, we are aware of certain things that may pose a higher risk for false positives. It could be something as simple as a vape cartridge that has ethanol in it. Even if the person is not impaired, we might be detecting that. So as we're testing and we find those things, we can tweak our algorithms to understand what we're seeing and make a determination of whether or not that counts as impaired driving. And we are aware that there may be certain medical conditions that could provoke a false positive, and we're doing a bunch of testing so that we can account for that. I will say that the idea of having a driver profile with specific mm -hmm. consumers' health diagnoses as part of that profile scares the living mm -hmm. daylights out of me, and I'm going to say no. Well, yeah. Thinking, I know. Sure. I, but that's, I mean, that, what well, you just said, I, I literally said, I don't know if you heard my eyes, that gives me a yes. heartburn. Like that, that, that would be going in the opposite direct direction of what we're talking about. I think one thing that we also didn't touch on um, that I think is a bigger question than any of us could attempt to answer is uh, one of the questions in the ANPRM asks about the, um, the health instances, but also asks what should happen, right? We've done the job of detecting impairment, and then there's kind of an open-ended kind of question from NHTSA to figure out what should happen. Should there be a way for someone who maybe was um, falsely you know, identified as impaired to override that? Um, should there be a way for if it detects impairment as you're in, in route, um, should it stop the vehicle? So there is a larger question here that, again, I, I don't think we have the answer for, and that is um, what's going to happen and how do we account for those? Because you're absolutely right, and I don't think anyone wants to tell their vehicle, I have a medical condition that, that accounts for X, Y, or Z, because now we've reached, uh, now drive that car in Washington State, and we've got a whole different set of issues, right? right? And so as we start to see kind of um, 
in, it's an interesting kind of segue, so apologies if it takes everyone to a weird turn, but um, we've seen like sectoral bills in privacy since we don't have that federal privacy legislation. We've started to see sectoral bills, for instance, health, really great um, concept to think about. And we started this year to really see it ramp up in the vehicle space. We started to see different states have um, take different approaches with how they actually are going to try and account for vehicle data. So we've seen um, California uh, start the process to think about just a general vehicle um, data privacy bill. We've seen Tennessee um, put forth a bill that would create an agency at the state level to collect consumer opt-in or opt-out um, for vehicle. It's very odd. It was the opposite of uh, opposite of data minimization, but that's another conversation. Um, we've seen New, um, New York uh, put forth proposal to amend their insurance law that would uh, that would require that insurance um, companies cannot consider telematics data as they are making determinations about insurance rates. So we're starting to kind of see um, what it looks like at the sectoral level for cars. Um, and it's going to be very interesting when it starts to collide with some of those other sectoral spaces. Um, so again, uh, creating a, a driver profile, no, um, I hope not. Um, it would be everyone's worst nightmare, I'm sure. Um, but also, it, it, that I think is one of the larger questions that hangs in the balance that's going to come out of the AMPRM and, and what NHTSA really has to grapple with here. And then, you know, I just want to add like a corollary. What, one of the things we struggle with, right, the, the goal of data minimization, which is showing up in lots of these laws as a way of worrying about too much data and where the data goes. So today you proposed an interesting example of a thing I didn't even know about, but hopefully some people know about, and, and maybe you have some survey people and research and so forth, but, but when a fraction of 1% of people with a certain pigment color of their skin or a certain minor medical thing, th that doesn't show up in your sample and your research until 100 million people are using it, and then all of a sudden, it's actually a lot of people that can't like start their car or can't, or, or who have a bad reaction to a drug or that sort of thing. And we have reporting rules when it comes to sort of drugs because we know that no matter how many clinical trials you did, once you roll it out, you learn that, it, well, there's a bad reaction when someone both takes Tylenol and watches TV and now they take the drug and you know something happens, right? So are there privacy enhancing technologies, are there techniques that will let us capture what we need to learn that some sub-segment of, of people are being you know, mistreated or that you could improve the product to make it more accurate without sort of opening the floodgates to collecting all the data all the time. And so this is broader than automotive, obviously, mm -hmm. but I think it's a, a tension that comes along with sort of blanket data minimization. Where is it that we do want collection, but we clearly don't want everyone giving us all their medical data, so are there reliable technologies that can give us the signal and I think that's critical in this day of AI, this day of like 100 different reasons why you might want you know, to collect data, but where we don't trust that if you collect it all, it'll go in one place. So anyway, just another area for, I think, important exploration. I, I'll just say that I think it's a great opportunity for the use of privacy-enhancing technologies. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that all five of the recommendations have come up organically, um, <laughs> with that being the, the fifth one, um, which was ensuring that throughout the process of creating, implementing, developing, thinking about these technologies, we are working in the privacy protections while also considering um, the impact on marginalized, multi-marginalized communities. Um, I think one of, uh, one of those communities that, we, that I really like to highlight in the vehicle space is the impact on rural communities versus more urban communities. I think there is a, something to be said about an individual who lives, um, you know, a community that's set 30 minutes from the hospital, right? And in an emergency situation, how is this technology going to account for, um, maybe we're at a birthday party and now there's an injury and those emergency situations where someone has to get behind the wheel to get where they're going. Um, and so thinking about all of those kind of uh, wide ranging um, circumstances as Jules mentioned, in the the point one percent of individuals who might fit a um, a specific um, uh, 
health um, health circumstance, um, those with different colored skin, if we're talking about uh, a, a camera that's going to detect impairment, well, can it actually detect the driver? Um, and so these different implications also need to be considered as we're thinking about it. Um, and with that, uh, would everyone join me in thanking our wonderful panelists today for joining us. Um, and that concludes our panel portion. Um, thank you for bearing with us as we uh, shuffled around time a little bit. We are actually going to proceed upstairs for our reception. So we'll head um, out the doors to the left, back to the elevators. And when you come up um, on the elevators, immediately to your left, we'll be there for the reception.